All right, welcome back. I'm here with Luke Davis, CEO of Diversifying IO. Uh, Luke, how are you doing, sir? I'm really good, Al. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course. And you're joining us from the UK, yeah? I am, yeah. So it's a very grey, dark um, evening UK at the moment. But yes, I'm, I'm based just north of London. All right. Well, well, good stuff. Well, thank you uh, for being here. I'll let you introduce yourself and what you're doing there at Diversifying, and then I'll come back at the end and we'll have a little chat. That sound good? Sounds great. All right. Enjoy. Cool. So look, my topic today is inclusive hiring. If our good intentions aren't good enough, then what can we do about it? So quick professional um, context background. So I'm a 20 plus year recruitment and talent leader. I've been told that once you hit the 20, you stop saying 21, 22. It just means quite quite a lot and you're showing your age. Um, I've done that in a real mix of organizations, both for big agencies, um, for outsourced recruiters, um, for internal talent functions, some big brands, charities, people you might have heard of like booking.com, um, Just Eat, PwC, and places like that. I've also done a lot of work with much smaller scale-up and startup organizations um, all over all over the world. And a bit about me personally, I'm a, a chair of a mental health awareness charity. Um, I'm also a dad, and we'll talk a bit about that in, in a while. Um, and in terms of my professional context, I class myself as an ally in training. More on that to come. Um, and I definitely wouldn't class myself as a, as a DNI expert. And again, more of that to come. But the organization that I'm a worker that I work for and I'm a part of um, has two brands. Um, we are Bain Recruitment, um, which focuses on equality within hiring practices, and diversifying.io, which is an inclusive careers platform for organizations wanting to showcase um, their, uh, their opportunities to a, a wider a wider audience. So why, why, why do I do this work? So there's two, two I think, real, real reasons for this. Um, the first one I wanted to share is a, is a bit of a personal story and, 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 and one I think that, that left, a, left a mark with me and given the context that we're in at the moment and everything that's happened in the last 12 months or so, I think a, an important one. So the, the picture on the bottom left is me when I was, a, I think, a five or six-year-old. Um, the pictures on the right, if you look at the, the green jerseys that people have got on, very uh, multicultural, very mixed school. That was my that was my first school. That was where I went from the ages of about four um, up until about seven or eight. Um, my parents moved, and we moved to I guess what was a more affluent area. And the picture that you can see on the top left is the school that ultimately the, that I moved to. And as you can probably see, um, the diversity there is 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 definitely not as, as strong as it was in the first one. And it and it left a mark with me. And and, and I'll talk more about that um, in, in a while. Um, my other big why. Um, so this here on the left is a picture of my daughter. Um, that's Elsa, who's seven. Um, not named directly after the Disney princess, but as we as we discovered and found out after we named her, um, she shares a name with the Disney princess that came out around the same time that, that, that she was born. Um, the picture in the middle was a, a present she left me. She took a load of selfies on my phone. And when I saw those when I was looking at pictures that I could use. And then on the right is the picture of us as a family. Now, I'm a white middle-aged um, um, man. Um, Cynthia, who founded Bain Recruitment, is a, a black um, female um, and founded founded the organization. And obviously Elsa is a, is a, is a mixed race, um, mixed race seven-year-old child. So you know, a big part of what we do, why we do it, is because we want to, to leave a better world and, and leave a better legacy. Now, why did I pick the topic today? And I think, you know, Within the professional context of what I do and what we do day to day, we spend a huge amount of time talking to organizations, mostly in the UK, but my experience is obviously not just, just UK led, in figuring out what they can do to attract a more diverse workforce or be more diverse as an organization. And the thing that I've noticed that is a, you know, the fundamental step change that's happened in the last year um, since the Black Lives Matter movement, and I think to a degree the pandemic, is that people have energy and intention to try and make a change and make a difference um, and you know that's great and i think that that energy should and can be harnessed i think where it's problematic though is there's a lot of things that, that get in the way so what i want to talk about for the remainder of the time that we have is partly around the mindsets and the perspectives that I think are getting in the way and also to talk to a bit around what my big fear is because we do a huge amount of work to improve job descriptions, improve people's careers pages, to do talent audits and that all work is needed and important but unless people's perspectives and mindsets are changing it won't matter because ultimately people will still hire the person they've always hired or will show the bias in the hiring process that they've always showed um, regardless. So I wanted to kind of shine a light on some of the kind of the common things that, that I think are getting in the way. So what do I think are good intention mindsets? Now, 
I think, you know, and, and just to be clear, you know, we, we as an organization only and will only work with people that want to make a difference. They're here for the right reasons. We believe that some people, if they really don't want to change, will, will never change. So I guess the, the people I'm talking about here are those that want to go on a journey, want to do better at this, but maybe need some help and support to, um, to get there. So the first thing would be, I guess, the difference between thought versus deed. And I guess this is, you know, part of that, you know, people, people thinking about doing things or making a difference and, and those taking action. I would also say those that are probably at the moment more reactive. So things like, you know, the black square, on Instagram um, versus people that are going about their day to day and trying to make a difference. Um, I also think that too many people often look at, particularly when it's hiring, that there might be a few quick fixes that you can make to the hiring process or the next round of hiring that they do. We can hire some people that are a bit different or look different. Um, you know, it's a complex problem. It's not a simple solution. It's a complex problem. It's a sum of um, 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 solutions that need to get there. And I think that's an area that, that people haven't really got to uh, mentally yet as well. Um, I think a big difference between those that are you know, sympathetic, you know, they're, they're, they, they appreciate that it's not right, but actually are they really doing things to analyze, I guess, their own part in that? And I, and I suppose I'm specifically talking about things like um, privilege and definitely, you know, even, even someone like me who's married to a black woman in the mixed race family, um, you know, big journey I had to go on in the last year was really thinking hard and questioning those very many years of being brought up in a very white, very, um, um, you know, decent socioeconomic background. Um, what things that I maybe overlooked and um, what privileges do I have that maybe I wasn't fully aware of? And I think that that personal journey that we can all go on, I think is needed, particularly needed when you are going to be hiring and looking to, to have a more diverse, diverse team. Um, I also think there's still a lot of fear. I think people are getting much better at talking about this stuff and I think particularly talking with their colleagues about this stuff, but I still think there's a long way to go. I still think too many people are, are scared of saying the wrong thing or maybe try to reach out and engage in conversation and say the wrong thing and get corrected and then don't engage anymore. I think that's a problem. Um, we definitely see a lot of organizations who are maybe a bit embarrassed about where they're at, maybe a bit embarrassed around the diversity that they have at the moment. And as a result, they don't want to rightly so do the whole kind of stock image thing or paint a picture of what they're not. But at the same time, um, maybe aren't being intentional enough around how they can reach out to and encourage and promote themselves to, um, to people who are from different backgrounds. Um, I also think that to a degree, people are still you know, a bit unclear around what their commitment is, a bit unclear around what their personal role is in making a difference um, with this with this as well. And I still definitely would say that I think there's work to be done around people, you know, and this is definitely a big thing that I had to do personally was you've got to get past that uncomfortable stage in dealing with a lot of this stuff. Like really addressing your biases is not easy um, and it's not, not comfortable, but I think there's some of the ground things, the foundations that need to be put into place before you can really, truly move, really, truly move forward. And the big thing that I'm a huge advocate of is that I think this, this particularly when it comes to recruitment, is having to unlearn as much, especially those of us that have been hiring or recruiting for a long time. Half the battle, I think, is unlearning what we've already learned and maybe isn't appropriate in today's um, day and age anymore. And the image I showed was one of somebody, you know, kind of trapped by a, a box that you can see out of. But I think we need to break out of that box before we can really, really address um, how we can how we can be um, be more inclusive in, in diversifying our our teams. So what can be done? You know, how can you start turning some of these um, you know, intentions, uh, good intentions that people have into action? Um, you know, one of the really helpful things that I did um, when I was you know, really starting to address and assess my own role that I could play was um, to think about my own biases. And I think that's great. And I think things like unconscious bias training are helpful and not a bad thing. But I also wonder sometimes though that's kind of you know, shining a light on the challenges, but not always necessarily giving people the, the framework or the ability to actually play an active role. Um, I would highly recommend a book by Karen Catlin, Better Allies. It was a huge help for me in really assessing and analyzing, particularly in the workplace, what I could do or what I was doing and could do more of. And interestingly, out of the, um, the ally roles that Karen um, um, references and talks about, I think I was probably doing two of them quite well. Um, but there were others that I wasn't doing. And I think it was a really helpful way for me, particularly to think about actually what other ally roles can I do, particularly, you know, for me, the one was being an upstander. So where you see things that aren't right, rather than just kind of observing it and, you know, feeling bad about it or not doing anything about it, like in the moment, proactively talking up, speaking up and and really upstanding against whatever it is that you see that's, that's not right. So I'd highly recommend that. And I think you know, getting people started on this journey um, is a really big and important part of, 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 making, of making progress. 
So what are, what about your know, hiring specifically then? And 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 you know, I guess what I would you know like to do here is set out what I think are some of the practical steps that you can take to to um, be better and be more inclusive in your in your hiring practices. Um, for me, the first thing that I would highly recommend is to set some clear objectives. Um, gather your your data. Um, you know, to really think about where you want to get to and who you want to attract. I think you need to understand where you're at, and I think that can vary from the country you're in. The city you're in, the town that you're in, the industry that you're in, um, the, the the sector that you're in. Um, I think all of these are important factors, and I think really you should be assessing how that is to really think about. You know, do you need more um, gender diversity at a senior level? Um, are you a tech organisation that's struggling to attract engineers because there aren't many engineers? And I think use that data to inform and shape where you need to get to. Um, next one would be to be really clear on your values. Um, one of the the worries or fears that I have is that I think a lot of DNI initiatives or work are bolt-ons, and I think actually if you really think deeply about the topic, most organisations I think can really see within their own values the diversity and inclusion, embracing difference, and innovation actually probably sits with those. And I think a refresh, a rethink of that, and finding out how DNI fits into what you are, make it part of your DNA as opposed to a DNI bolt-on or a DEI and I bolt-on, I think is is really really important. Um, I then highly recommend building new job descriptions. Um, I think I see too often that um, people, particularly when you're hiring big companies, hiring for the same role over and over again, that you take a job description, you refresh it, you update it. And I think particularly given everything that's happened in the last 12 months or so, um, I think we need to be better at doing job descriptions. I think tired language, coded language, masculine language, dated language around the culture, things like fast paced or, or words that don't mean anything like strip it back, go again, build new job descriptions and also build job descriptions of which are really clear on the skills that somebody needs to have, not necessarily, you know, kind of the experiences um, them, that, that you want them to bring. It should be around what they can do, not what they've done. Um, so be really, really clear on that. And I think that will help. Um, the other biggie, and this is where I talk a lot around you know, needing to unlearn what we've learned is I think one of the biggest and hardest things to do is to focus within your hiring process around what somebody can do not just what they've done. You know, if we accept that, opportunities have been primarily given to those who are from certain backgrounds or certain demographics. That means that we're always going to struggle if we're always looking at somebody that's got 10 years worth of experience of doing a certain thing or is only coming with the job titles or working with competitors. We need to think a bit more deeply and we need to look a bit more at adjacent skills and adjacent experience. And I think the best way to do that is if you're really clear on the skills and you're really clear on what somebody needs to do and then build a process which can assess for that and that can assess for those skills and experience um, regardless of, of someone's background. Um, once you've built these new job descriptions, um, then you're in a position, I think, to start building job adverts and going to market. Um, they're not the same thing. And I think too often people confuse job descriptions and job adverts as being the same thing. Um, job adverts, I think, are particularly important because they should be attracting someone to apply to the job not putting somebody off by having really long shopping lists of requirements or or being overly you must have. Um, you know, try and bring people in, be clear on what you want, be really clear on who would be good for the role, um, who, who who could be a good candidate for it. And once you've done that, then think quite deeply around who are the audiences that I want to get in front of. And actually, if I've been measuring my data or our data around who applies to our jobs, what else should I do? Are there different job boards that I can go to? Are there events that I could sponsor? Are there different audiences that I can become closer to as a company to, to get that message um, in front of them? Then once you are actively looking, make sure that all candidates are going through the same process. And, and, and that includes referrals or friends of friends. And then I always think back to the first team that I was responsible for that I built. And I hired a couple of good people. They hired their friends. They hired their friends as friends and friends before I knew it. We had a lot of very similar people with very similar backgrounds and very similar um, degrees that were, that were working with us. So be fair, be robust, put everybody through the same process. I also think then that when you're running through the recruitment process, don't be afraid to to pause and take um, um, breaks during the process to have a look at what the data is telling you. You know, if you go to market and you're mostly getting candidates from a particular background, maybe you need to to wait to interview and work a bit harder to attract more people from different backgrounds. Maybe if you're only getting certain types of candidates that are making it through to the interview stages, why is that? Maybe again, you need to think about how that's happened. Is that really fair, or has any bias crept in? And I think being really Really deliberate and intentional around making sure that, that, that there's as little or no bias during the process as possible I think is really really important and then when you're assessing 
be really clear on the interview questions you're asking, be really clear on what you're assessing, agree with those things up front and in advance, and score it and document so that if anyone's challenged on it, that you can be really clear on why you're asking the questions and how you scored the individuals. Um, that way you can remove as, as, as much subjectivity or, or bias from the process as possible. Um, and I think the other big one is, and I think this is a problem with recruitment, is that focus less on can I find the perfect person, focus more on letting the process do its job. If you do things in the right way and you've built a robust process, you will make good hires. You will make good hires who are aligned with your values. You'll make good hires who will stay with you. You'll make good hires who are the best for the job regardless of their backgrounds. And I would recommend that those are the things that you should do to build a really a really good and robust um, way of, of, of attracting and then hiring hiring people. And then lastly, before inviting any questions, I wanted to just share you know, something that we see or I see as being important. It's certainly a, um, something that we stand by is that sometimes this work and this desire to change can feel overwhelming because there is so much work to do. Um, and every company, doesn't matter how well, what progress they're making, all has a part of their organization that probably isn't doing great in some of these areas around diversity is that I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. And I think that really Realization that we all as individuals can play our part and if we play our part positively um, and in a way that make a difference soon those ripples can turn into a wave so I'm going to stop sharing so thank you for um, for listening I hope that was um, I hope that was helpful and interesting um, and any questions that anyone may have hey Al, Al, how are you doing I'm doing well I'm, I'm back here and I'll help facilitate and I'll start off I mean first off thank you I mean, thanks for being you. Thanks for uh, you know, engaging the mission that you're on. It's inspiring. It's immensely appropriate. It, it's insightful. Uh, obviously, you've gone down several layers beyond just the uh, superficial, let's hire more people of, of color. And one of the yeah. things that I want to highlight, particularly given that you're you know, coming from the recruitment field, is that we have to acknowledge uh, like I, I, I um, consider myself an ally. Uh, yeah. I played uh, basketball and football here in the United States, you know, so I have a very diverse group of friends background. That being said, uh, when you said ally in training, it kind of took yeah. me aback a little bit. It's like, you know, that part of my journey is not done. I'm not like, you know, there's not like, oh, you're a great ally. It's like, hey, I got more to learn there, which goes to my question is that we have a lot of, self-reflection and self-awareness that we need to create beyond what we have done in um, our personal lives. And yeah. so my point of question is this, is that what responsibility, both socially and to the organization, do leaders have to create learning experiences, uh, you know, self-reflection experiences, whatever it is, to help the organization get uh, better at appreciating other ways of being other types of people because many are just saying hey you know that's that's out there but you know what, what's your feeling about that you know what should leaders be doing that they're not yeah i think um and and look obviously a lot of the work i do is is, is often partnering with heads of dni or if they don't have um heads of edni hr departments and that question comes up a lot the advice we always give is to say build it into the job description of your leaders. It's no longer a, you know, I'm a conscientious leader. That's something that I should be doing. I should be thinking about. If you are committing to this, you've come out and you've made those big statements um, back in March and April last year, this has to be part of the job descriptions of every single leader. And part of that needs to be, how do I not just go and you know, hire within my own teams, but how do I create, you know, how do I as a leader be responsible for creating a culture where everybody is going on their own their own journey of self-discovery and realizing that to be a great ally, you're not going to get any credit. This is about something that you should do because you believe in equality. You're not going to get a pat on the back about it. This is not yeah. this is not your chance to shine like it might be in a in a in a, in a work situation or work setting. And I think that has to start with a leader. And it's a you know, you've made the statement, great. Now I have to find a way. And I think it's that find a way that's the important part. Well, <laughs> You know, thank you. I, I, you're getting me excited. I, I, I'm going to present a little bit this afternoon and, and a lot of what you said not only aligns, but you're, you're frankly you know, challenged me to think uh, a bit differently. And so I want to ask you a personal question. You have a multiracial family. Uh, yeah. Your journey is going to 
go for the rest of your life. And you've made a professional commitment to, to help the world be a better place in this regard. So as you, you know, fast forward here in 2021, given everything that's happened in the States and around the yeah. world uh, regarding Black Lives Matter in particular, I mean, what do you hope to see that's not happening? Um, I imagine you would like your email to you know <laughs> blow up and and you know, get that actually i shouldn't use the term blow up um you know, it, get a lot of emails a lot of phone calls um yeah it is enough happening what i think like and um, there's not enough happening i think there's lots of positive intention there's things getting in the way still and it's been interesting actually because our our motto as an organization this year is to be braver braver with mm -hmm. what we say braver with how we say it and actually mm -hmm. interesting a few of the organizations we partner with who we've been struggling to get them to be brave they're actually saying like look now's the time to be brave so i think all of that corporate sensibility that kind of social etiquette that exists i think in this challenge it's not welcome it's not helpful we need to get past that we need to get more into human beings whatever that that kind of work dances that we do with each other where it's all in code and it's not said and it's all it's all kind of like hidden meaning let's yep. strip that out let's start being real as soon as we start being real take our egos out of the picture take our hierarchy out of the picture then we can start moving forward so i think that's my big fear that's the bit that has to shift that's the bigger movable part that's still in the way i think yeah, I got one more question. I see some questions that come in um, and I'm going to you know, make sure I get these to you and maybe you can follow up with these individuals sure. uh, directly. Um, the question I, I had a, a conversation last week with an executive at a global recognized brand mm -hmm. and we were talking about the uh, potential polarization um, of activism versus professionalism. So, you know, a business isn't meant for you to go in and just, you know, trumpet, you know, this and, or, or that, and, and you, you have a job to do. Um, however, that doesn't mean leave your humanity, you know, at the door. It, it does mean, you know, advocating and you, you're really aligning yourself with the values of the company while also, you know, hopefully those values align with how you want to show up in the world. So can you speak to that, um, you know, the sometimes dichotomy of activism versus professionalism? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and as an organization, we've had some challenges that with ourselves because we've, mm -hmm. as we were growing up and we were starting to do this work more and more, we, we hired some activists. And while we absolutely supported a lot of the missions they were on in the work setting, maybe some of that activism wasn't helpful to the mission or mm -hmm. certainly the mission in a way that we want to address it and deal with it. Um, I guess the best way I would, I would talk to that is that I think that if you can create safe spaces and can create dialogue and genuine dialogue where there is action and there is change i think activism has somewhere to go and i think unless you're creating the space for this un you know, discomfort annoyance frustration to exist i think it can become activism and i think too often i see that people are scared and this is what i mean by the fear bit is that you don't create the spaces for people to talk about it because you start to open the lid and whoa okay what just came out and we saw that a lot with what happened after Black Lives Matter, that there was things from two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, that then came out again, or people revisited in their workplaces mm -hmm. because they weren't happy and weren't comfortable. And people were just really desperate to get the lid back on, but the lid yeah. was off. So now yeah. the lid's off, let's talk about it, deal with it and move on. And I think if you don't create that, you're gonna get negative activism that isn't gonna serve the purpose and actually is gonna be an obstruction to, to moving forward. So I think that's what I mean by brave, is like create places for reasonable activism to exist, as soon as it becomes unlawful or not within the company values, then obviously that is a that is a problem. That's a different issue. But I think you need to be brave around a level of um, activism that is acceptable in the context of your organization. Yeah, well, well thank you for saying that because I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And, you know, I'm actually, I know we're coming up on time, but I want to sneak in one question from um, Nolia uh, Fernandez. Uh, Nolia, I hope I got your name uh, pronounced correctly. You can uh, slap me on the wrist if, uh, if I didn't. But uh, it, particularly in recruiting and assessments, you know, yeah. so you were saying earlier, and I 100% agree, Thomas Chamorro uh, Music has echoed this, uh, in that if we get better at understanding who we want, not only in terms of their past background, but in what's going to help them be successful in that role and beyond, yeah. then we can hire better, not just the people who have been doing this for 10 years. Or so, so yeah. you know, how to craft those assessments is just really getting clear on who the, not only the skills, technical skills, but the behaviors that you want people to, to have. Can you speak to that real quick? 
Yeah, definitely. And I think it is it is a mindset shift. But for example, we've got a role at the moment and it's for a really senior sales director type individual and it's to sit on a board. And if we were hiring that in the old way, it'd be like, right, we need them to have worked 10, 15, 20 years within a similar environment. We need them to have done deals that were this size, etc. When you strip down to like, hey, how's this person going to be successful in the job? Actually, the big thing that came out of it was that it needs to be someone who's a bit like a conductor and a, a, um, a conductor of an orchestra, somebody who's mm -hmm. really brilliant at taking lots of different disparate parts all over the world, connect, is mm -hmm. connecting people and organizations, knows when to push, when, when to lean back. Now, that is really different from can we go and find somebody that's got 20 years experience working for a competitor? And I think when you yeah. shoot it to your point, start to frame it around success. What does someone mm -hmm. need to be to be successful? It's harder because you might need to go and speak to more people but actually mm. a lot clearer on what are the things the really core things that someone needs to be good at to be great at this role that's what i mean by kind of how you reframe those questions far less mm. around what the badges they've got from the companies they've worked at or the conquest they've got more around what are the things they can do that we need absolutely could cannot celebrate that more luke uh, you know again uh congratulations on what you're doing thanks for Thank being you. you uh anything i can do to support you as uh, you move forward please let me know I, i'm an instant thank fan you. and i know a lot of people listening are and and will be thank so you. again thank you appreciate it i really really appreciate being here thank you so much thanks everyone all right all right be well bye-bye take care bye